Hello, all you crazy cats out there. Welcome back to Acne Beautiful with Morgan Elizabeth. Thank you all for joining me again today. We are going to continue with part two of hormones and acne, hormonal acne, by discussing the endocrine system today. In other words, your hormone system. First though, I want to introduce something special to you guys that I'm really excited about. Starting this evening around 6.30 Central Standard Time, you will be able to see a post on um, my Acne Beautiful Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, Morgan Elizabeth, and little shout outs to this company in my YouTube videos, which if you haven't already subscribed to Acne Beautiful, go ahead, subscribe, give us a thumbs up. We love you so much. It means so much to me. Um, New Skin. New Skin is a really wonderful company that I stand behind and I'm really excited to be able to share with all of the Acne Beautiful community. Topical solutions for the skin are not something I've talked much about yet, but it is an area that I have a very diverse selection of knowledge regarding and I've tried a lot of different things over the years. I have spent more money than I'd like to admit on different topical solutions and um, products that some have been amazing and I've kept around and some have been, you know, just not worth the time or the money. The reason why I'm excited to um, offer new skin as a compliment to Acne Beautiful is mainly because it's a company that I really like. They're reputable. Um, they have very nice clean skincare products that will assist you with your skin uh, clear skin journey. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the topical portion of clearing your skin from within is a small portion of the pie, but nevertheless, it's still an important portion of the pie because if you buy the wrong crap, your skin's going to react. <laughs> uh, the other great reason why I'm excited to offer new skin is because, you know, it doesn't send you on a wild goose chase. It's something that I can add to Acne Beautiful to complement what I'm already offering you guys. So really all it does is offer you an opportunity to purchase something that I already like and purchase myself. So you can just kind of jump on the bandwagon, so to speak, and add your purchase to the order that I'm already making. So it really helps you guys out and it helps me out in terms of us all saving a little bit money with a bulk package order. And what else from there? Oh, it supports Acne Beautiful in a small way. It's a little bit of a contribution. If you're looking for a way to have a product to try and to use and to love and feel like you're giving back to the community in a small way, then you'll be able to do that. Um, look forward to my first post on New Skin this evening around 6.30 Central Standard Time. It's going to follow this video's premiere, which will be at 5.30 Central Standard Time. And actually the first product I'm going to be premiering is not a topical product for you to put on your skin, but trust me, many of those are coming and they're so cool. It's actually a toothpaste. It is a naturally whitening toothpaste, an antimicrobial toothpaste. The reason why I'm starting with the toothpaste is because the health of your mouth, the health of your oral cavity is directly related to the health of your overall system. And again, that is related to the health of your skin. The skin is the largest organ in the body and we don't want it to be the dumping ground, the waste ground for all of the stuff that needs to come out. There are other systems in place to release the toxins and we need to have everything working as it should in order for those systems to operate correctly. And that includes a healthy microbial um, environment in your mouth and no cavities, please, right? And who doesn't want whiter teeth? right? And there is no bleach, no peroxide, none of those harsh chemicals that many, many people have tried to use over the years to whiten their teeth. So I'm really happy and really excited to be able to add new skin as a compliment to Acne Beautiful um, because it is not something that I have to go out there and 
sell and pound the pavement. I'm not interested in that. I'm just interested in sharing something that I already love in a way that makes it accessible and convenient for you guys um, and is part of the Acne Beautiful community. As opposed to me saying to you, hey, I really love this product and you can go ahead and find it yourself and purchase it on your own and send you on a wild goose chase and it doesn't provide anyone with any sort of financial um, incentive or like discount, so to speak. So there are a lot of good things in keeping it in the family and that's what we're doing by bringing new skin into the family. We are keeping it all in the family. Yeah. All right, so endocrine system, guys. So we're gonna continue our understanding of hormonal acne and we're only just sort of scratching the surface here um, by understanding the endocrine system or your hormone system. So let's briefly review what are hormones chemical messengers that tell other systems in our body what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. Pretty big, important jobs these things have. So what kind of messages do hormones send? Things like, it's time to go to sleep, it's time to wake up, um, we need to add sugar to the bloodstream, take sugar out of the bloodstream, um, hey, there's a big ball of stress in my life. I need to um, get ready to fight or flight. Uh, what other messages? Raise the blood pressure, please. Uh, drop the blood pressure. Get you in the mood for you know what. Time to release an egg or to menstruate and so on and so on and so on. There are a lot of different messages that are sent because there are thousands and thousands of jobs that our hormones take on. They interact with each other and they are interdependent upon each other to make these things happen. Think of like a car engine, it's kind of a silly analogy, but if one part of the engine is affected, it can affect every other part or process related to it. Suddenly it's one big thing that you have to figure out, understand, and trace something back to. Now a car engine and the intricacies of the human body are nowhere near the same, but just to give you a little visual, maybe. Anyway, finding hormonal balance is not only important, but it can be challenging. And that's why we are here talking about this stuff. Add to it something like taking birth control for years and years, um, and you could have a potentially even bigger mess to clean up. I myself did take hormonal contraception for t upwards of 10 years. I mean, you get to a point in time with things where you just kind of stop counting. So it was about 10 or 11 years and I finally decided that I was brave enough to remove the last thing from my lifestyle that was holding me back from feeling like I was achieving clear skin without any external drug related influences because yes hormonal contraception falls under the category of a prescription drug and i just didn't want it besides that if i ever wanted to have a baby of my own i needed to prepare my body to be able to do that so for me i've been off of hormonal contraception for about two and a half years now and it there was a transition period without a doubt and my hormones are still adjusting to having been on those um, synthetic hormones for so long uh, so it's a process just remember that you're not alone and that is why we are here and if you are taking hormonal contra contraception and you feel like it's time that you want to remove that from your lifestyle um, there is support, there are healthy ways of doing it to minimize um, the flare-ups that can occur when you take them away, okay? So, oh right, so anyway, that leads us right into when balance is in place, beautiful things happen. Your skin, your overall health, and your energies are just through the roof in a great way. And who doesn't want happy skin, healthy bodies, and more energy? Yeah, we throw a lot of money at these things, don't we? <laughs> so how do hormones do their jobs, right? There are organs, glands, and cells that produce hormones, and most of those are produced in the endocrine system. 
um, the endocrine glands, which compri are comprised of the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the thyroid. So the thyroid is in the front of the neck. Most of us are familiar with it. The doctor presses it, makes sure it's um, a good size. It sets the body's metabolism and is linked to fat burning and um, body temperature, actually, to name a few. Then we have our pancreas. We have insulin and glucagon related to the pancreas jobs, and this helps regulate our blood sugar. Then we have the ovaries. Okay, there's estrogen, progesterone, and small amounts of androgen and testosterone, which are produced from signals sent from the pituitary gland. Estrogen regulates our menstrual cycle, ladies, which most of us know. So, okay, that being said, we're going to transition into some lady stuff for a minute. Let's talk about the menstrual cycle. Men, you can listen up too, because it's great to be able to tune in to what's going on with your lady. So day one through 14 is the follicular stage. Day one of your cycle is the first day of your period. And it's the first day of the follicular phase, which lasts until ovulation, when the egg is released from the ovaries. During this stage, follicle stimulating hormone is released from the pituitary to signal to the ovaries to begin maturing an egg. It also tells estrogen to rise, in which turn tells the uterus to prepare for an egg to be fertilized. Day 14-ish, um, we come into the ovulatory phase. Now, this varies for women as to when it occurs, but nevertheless, Estrogen rises to signal luteinizing hormone, causing the follicle to release the egg down the fallopian tubes and into the uterus. Somewhere around this day 14 or so, um, the, the egg is ready to be fertilized and you have about a 48 hour window. Testosterone levels stay pretty level throughout all of this time in the month, but a small rise in testosterone can be detected around ovulation, and this is to get you in the mood. Uh, this is also why some women can experience acne around ovulation. Day 14 through 18, we move into the luteal phase, this is when the ruptured follicle turns into a corpus luteum and releases large amounts of progesterone to prepare the uterus for implantation of the fertilized egg. Estrogen now begins to fall and progesterone is now higher than estrogen. That's important. If no fertilization occurs, all hormones begin to drop around day 25 and the uterus gets ready to shed its lining and you get your period. So this is around a day uh, 28 and we have therefore a 28 day-ish cycle. All right, so that final week is often when the ladies experience more hormonal acne around the chin and the jawline and those pesky PMS symptoms. This happens if if progesterone is lower in comparison to estrogen at a time when progesterone should be higher than estrogen. So this is big ticket information right here. And I'm gonna rewind that for a second. So during that final week when many women experience hormonal acne flare-ups and PMS symptoms, and this doesn't have to be every single cycle, right, ladies? It can happen one time, then not the next time, and you're like, what the heck's going on? Was it a bad month? I don't know. <laughs> but this is what happens when progesterone is lower than estrogen. Um, it's at a time when progesterone is supposed to be higher, comparatively speaking, than estrogen. So we wanna remember that. Okay, let's talk about pregnancy for one second. Then we have a fertilized egg, it implants in the uterus, and progesterone and estrogen stay high. 
They don't even drop. So if you don't get your period, but you do get pregnant, progesterone will stay high and estrogen stay high. And these are to, um, this is to assist you in keeping that pregnancy going. So some women experience clear skin during pregnancy. Perhaps if their estrogen and progesterone ratio was low compared to testosterone and that surge in estrogen and progesterone happen with the pregnancy, it may just kind of balance everything out for them. For other pregnancies, um, it can cause really bad acne in people. And as high estrogen and progesterone um, increase, it can also potentially increase that androgenic activity in the skin or that conversion that happens in the skin. And we'll talk a little bit more about that conversion a, a little bit later. But, but the main takeaway really is that this all depends on your pre-pregnancy hormonal state. So once again, we can see that not one size fits all. It depends on what's going on with your hormones before you have the pregnancy. Because some people will say, well, I mean, she had clear skin during her pregnancy. I was expecting clear skin. What happened? I didn't have the clear skin. So it really depends on where those hormones are at before the pregnancy. So you can pay attention to all of this by charting your cycle. And there are a lot of apps out there these days. Um, Natural Cycles is one that I've used and it makes it really, really easy to track your cycle, symptoms, everything is right there for you. Super easy to see. Something we want to remember is that irregular and painful periods, even though we've become used to them as like normal, they are not, they are not normal um, and they can indicate a hormonal imbalance. So no worries, major hormones with acne. Let's jump into the hormones now. Okay. So first we're going to talk about the androgens and testosterone, the other San Francisco treat. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. Okay, the androgens and testosterone, ha ha. So androgens comprise a family of male sex hormones, including testosterone, D-H-E-A-S, D-H-E-A, androstenone, blah, blah, blah. that one always trips me up. In fact, the other ones that I just use the acronyms for are really long, I'm not, I, you know, I just, I'll butcher the heck out of them, but for sake of ease, DHEA-S, DHEA, androstenodione, and androstenone. Oh my gosh. Anyway, it doesn't really matter that I can't say them very well. Um, but as stated in the previous video, they are hormones that act directly on the sebaceous glands in the skin to produce acne. In the previous video, I just referred to them as the androgens and testosterone. But you can see here that the androgens are made up of four different ones. DHEA-S, DHEA, androstenodione, and androstenonone. Oh my God, mouthfuls. Um, please forgive me for butchering things. So having acne doesn't necessarily mean that you have excess testosterone or DHT that will reveal itself on a blood or saliva test. That's because those elevated testosterone levels that would show up on tests would be much more dramatic. The tests pick up on levels that are higher in a much more dramatic way. They don't pick up on lower, more subtle changes or levels, okay? They're picking up on higher levels um, that would indicate other conditions and symptoms like hair loss, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, here, oh, here's another one, hirsutism, um, which is the uh, growth of hair in unwanted places. These are androgen driven conditions. Okay. So if you do not have these testosterone excess symptoms and do not show high levels in tests like a blood test or saliva test, then it's possible that there's um, androgenic activity in your skin that's just highly linked to your acne because other hormones are out of balance. Okay, it's confusing, I know, but that's all right. So if you don't have high levels of testosterone or DHT on a saliva test and no excess 
androgen symptoms, like those ones I just mentioned that are more severe. But you do see high levels of DHEAS and androstenodione, then that may be part of the problem. As these two are converted directly in the skin to DHT. And there's a study on this that I'm going to post below that you guys can reference because once again, be your own advocate, check on the information, do your own research. There's a lot of stuff out there and we are talking about some heavy duty information, aren't we? Yes, we are. I know it's confusing, but hang in there. I've like gone over the stuff so many times over the years and it still can trip me up too. But the point is to research it, try and understand it, talk about it, um, apply it to your own life and then have support, right? Okay, so that was testosterone and the androgens, just a basic rundown on them. Let's get into insulin and IGF-1. Insulin is a hormone, as said already, secreted by the pancreas when we eat food. So food's broken down into sugars and proteins and it's transported into the bloodstream, um, which then the insulin takes those molecules to the cells where it's needed, right? So we get some energy and other things that happen. But when you eat food that's broken down into sugars too quickly, um, and we all know, you know, sugary things, um, refined carbohydrates, so we're talking about our breads, our bagels, um, even those, even those non-refined ones like a like a, um, brown rice and all of your gluten-free grains and your um, whole grain bread, you know, they're a little bit better than the refined, but they still do have a um, an effect on the blood sugar. Um, other things like large quantities of white potatoes and honestly, so weird, but even poor quality oils, even though they're not um, carbohydrates, they can actually have an effect on the blood sugar. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into the workings of your blood sugar and keeping it stable and the job of insulin in your pancreas. Nevertheless, uh, your pancreas releases more insulin than normal to bring those blood sugar levels back down. Um, we all know because of diabetes in this country that desensitization occurs over time to this hormone insulin. And when that occurs, your, your pancreas needs to pump out even more insulin to bring your blood sugar levels back down when you eat too many carbohydrates in one shot, especially if you don't get up, get out, and move your body to use that energy. So yeah, we all have days where we eat too many carbohydrates, right? So one thing you can do to mitigate that effect if you feel like you slipped up and you didn't regulate your blood sugar by controlling the foods that you eat, just get up and move. Get up and move. Go for a walk, go for a run, dance around, go for a bike ride, go for a hike, do some yoga. Whatever you like to do, just move your body and you will start to use that. Um, anyway, the whole point is that over time, insulin resistance can develop and then down the road from there, it can develop into type two diabetes, something that nobody wants and honestly, nobody needs to deal with. Um, blood sugar is actually something that's really easy to control through diet and lifestyle and it can really help your skin dramatically. Okay, so here's a little bit more on that and why it can help your skin. So IGF-1 is a growth hormone, which I mentioned in the last video as well. It's secreted with insulin. So higher insulin levels, you know, more carbohydrates in your diet, higher insulin levels, less exercise, equals higher IGF-1 levels too. We don't want that. You may recall from last week, I mentioned that IGF-1 is naturally found in dairy products, um, especially milk, because it's literally food for a baby, a growing baby animal. So IGF-1 contributes to sebum or oil production in the cells. In fact, it contributes to overproduction of oil as well as overproduction of those um, skin cells. Remember those skin cells growing too big too fast? IGF-1 is related to that. It also stimulates an enzyme which converts 
testosterone to DHT, which is a double whammy for your skin. So we want to keep our insulin levels down, which will help keep our IGF-1 down. And we can do that by controlling our blood sugar. And we can do that by controlling the foods that we eat, like eliminating things like dairy if we are super prone to acne, okay? These two work in tandem. Let me go back a little bit. Um, testosterone and DHT, they work in tandem to stimulate, so sorry, <laughs> so sorry, insulin and IGF-1 work in tandem to stimulate the androgen production in the skin, making your skin more sensitive to androgens. Um, something that we want to avoid, right? We want to avoid that potential natural higher sensitivity that acne prone people can have to the androgens already. Again, um, it sounds complicated, but it comes down to things like controlling your blood sugar with the foods that you eat and lifestyle choices and eliminating or reducing dairy products to help further control that by, by um, lowering that IGF-1 factor that comes in to play with insulin, they work together. And by doing all of that, we also end up affecting, in a good way, the androgenic activity in our skin. So this is all part of the big web and puzzle that can um, really affect hormonal acne. And honestly, you know, we might as well just say acne on a whole because we all have hormones and we're all dealing with hormones all the time. All right. IGF-1, one more little note on it, it's most active during our teenage years um, because one is growing, right? We're getting bigger and stronger, we're going through puberty. So yeah, teenage acne. But teens can also really reduce um, acne in a big, big way by again, having a nutrient-dense diet, keeping the blood sugar levels stable. Mm and avoiding dairy products. And I've seen this work wonders with teens struggling with acne, uh, full-blown cystic and pustule acne, yeah. So if you're a teen, there's you don't have to just you know, wait it out. You can actually take control of the situation while you're young too. All right, estrogen, moving on to estrogen. It's lady time. Estrogen is really cool. It affects mood, optimism, brain power, um, your conversational abilities, your energy, your hunger levels, your feelings of outgoingness, your stress levels, and mate identification, as well as pain tolerance. There are three types of estrogen. Um, estrone, which I'll refer to as E1. Again, I'm gonna butcher these. Estradiol, E2, and estriol, E3. So I'll refer to them as E1, E2, E3. E3 is the weaker of the three and responsible for the good estrogen effects. E2 and E1 are a little bit stronger and more aggressive, and we're gonna talk about those. Then we have something called xenoestrogens, and this is very, very, very important because you have a lot of external control over these, um, as long as you have the awareness. So xenoestrogens are synthetic estrogens that come from our environment. They are huge hormonal disruptors, huge. And they are referred to as endocrine disruptors. And there are entire um, books and lectures and conversations that can be had on endocrine disruptors alone, xenoestrogens. I say they come from our environment because we find them in pesticides, plastics, makeup, gas fumes, cleaning products, air fresheners, personal care products, perfumes, colognes, etc., etc., etc. If it has a scent to it and it is not a natural, organic, um, essential oil, where was my brain for a second? <laughs> Estrogen, please. Um, yeah, if it's not an essential oil from a plant, from the environment, this, these non-natural chemically manufactured scents 
are xenoestrogens. They um, are synthetic estrogens. And here is the bad part. Here is the ticker. They take up home in our estrogen receptor sites, blocking our good estrogen, E3, from moving into those receptor sites. They are literally bullies that push estrogen, E3, the good one, out of its home, takes up its home in the receptor sites. It's really bad news. And a lot of the estrogen-driven cancers are potentially related to these synthetic estrogens. You have huge control over the xenoestrogens in your life um, in, a, in many ways. Yeah, I, I know you're at the gas station and you're pumping gas and you can't really control that too much. Um, these days we're all wearing these masks. Maybe it's filtering a little bit of the sense. I have definitely noticed recently that um, when I walk through some of the aisles that I used to hold my breath going down, like the aisles with all the cleaning products and the air fresheners, um, the scent is a little bit less coming through my N95 mask. Yeah, it's not going to work with a bandana, but yeah. You know. um, I say you have a lot of control because one thing you can choose organic foods if you have the financial ability to do so. Um, you can choose different self-care products that have natural ingredients to reduce or eliminate your exposure to xenoestrogens and the same thing with your cleaning products and these have become much more mainstream. You can find these products even in places like Walmart these days. So we are moving in the right direction but you have to vote with your dollar and voting with your dollar is not only good for the environment and the producers of these um, good uh, good um, products, but it's also good for your health too. And that's what we want. So there are also some estrogen copycats out there. These are phytoestrogens. Uh, they are found naturally in certain foods. Two big ones I'll mention, flaxseed and soy. Um, they're not as harmful as xenoestrogens. I don't even like to use the word harmful in relation to them, but there's a lot of debate um, regarding phytoestrogens and it comes down to again your personal body makeup your history and your hormonal like balance or unbalance um, in order to determine how phytoestrogens affect you so I'm personally a fan of flax I like flaxseed um, oil I like flaxseed um, flax seeds ground up into the meal um, I do keep my soy consumption to a minimum, and soy is a very highly um, processed food in a lot of ways, and it tends to be uh, GMO. So it's harder to find soy um, that is non-GMO, and to find soy that's maybe in a more digestible form, something that's fermented, and you know, so on, so on down the line. Uh, but honestly, guys, the point of talking about this is to understand that the ultimate effect on your body with all of this comes down to how you metabolize things. So the liver breaks down hormones, estrogens specifically, in a two-stage process, which we could talk about in a full video too, but these metabolites are 2-hydroxyestrone, which is like the angel, and 16 hydrog hyd blah, 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 hyd I'm gonna do all the butchering again. 16 hydro ugh, estrone, and um, I have to look here. And four hydro hydros estrone. Oh my god! Just remember, two is the good one, the little angel. 16 and four are the devils. Um, you don't even have to remember that much. Uh, if anything, you take away from that is that the liver breaks down estrogen in a two-stage process and um, it is a, a pretty big process um, that the liver has to go through. And if you do take oral contraceptive pills, you are getting more estrogen because what they do is trick your body into thinking it's pregnant essentially. Um, and what happens when you're pregnant, your estrogen and your progesterone levels are higher. Um, it's also part of the reason why um, ac um, 
uh, birth control pills can help some people with their acne condition. In fact, it did help me with mine, which is part of why I was really, really um, fearful of going off of them because it was like the last thing I needed to remove. And after so many years of perfecting things lifestyle and diet wise, I was, I was definitely afraid of being flung back into full blown acne. And I did, I did have to deal with it again, but I moved through it pretty quickly. And um, two and a half years later, I do still have, I'm still figuring out my, um, my hormones and my monthly cycle. So something to think about if you've never used hormonal contraception and you're thinking about adding it in, it is a bigger decision than most people make it out to be. And they're constantly throwing that stuff at us like candy and it's like, oh, it's free, it's candy, it's free, it's candy. And it's not, it's not, and it's not free for your body. <laughs> um, I'm not saying it's all bad, but it's just, it's a really personal decision and you need all the information and it's hard to get all the information especially in one stop okay so that breakdown of estrogens in the liver and that two-stage process it all depends um and then the three different kinds that it breaks down into the the angel and then the two devils that depends on your liver's preference in terms of the pathways. So if your liver prefers the pathway of the 2 hydroxoestrone, blah, then um, that angel one, then it's going to prefer that good estrogen, that E3. If your liver prefers the other two pathways, then it has this preference for the more aggressive estrogens. All right. So what we want to know about those more aggressive estrogens, E1 and E2, which break down into the metabolites, the 4 and the 16 with the blah, 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 hydroxy, blah, blah, that I can't pronounce. <laughs> those two devils, so to speak, tend to increase DHT conversion in the skin, making you more sensitive to androgens once again. So that's the key takeaway there. Um, especially, especially if your progesterone is imbalanced. So the right amount of progesterone and estrogen in relation to progesterone um, keep that DHT conversion low. So when the progesterone is supposed to be high in relation to estrogen, we want it to be high. And when the estrogen is supposed to be higher in relation to the progesterone, we want that to be high. So those ratios um, are dependent upon each other and the rest of your hormonal functioning. And if that progesterone is imbalanced when it's too low and it should be high, for example, um, we can have that conversion in the skin that makes us more sensitive to androgens that we do not want as acne prone people. We want to keep that, those DHT levels low and we want to therefore um, see that effect of less sensitivity to the androgens and the androgen conversions that can happen in the skin. So um, yeah, the takeaway from that is honestly, when progesterone is too low and or estrogen is too high, there can be trouble a brewing. Um, often this is referred to as estrogen dominance. So between the xenoestrogens, the phytoestrogens, and all of the other things that we've talked about, estrogen dominance, dominance is not uncommon anymore. And there are certain cancers that are driven by these aggressive estrogens. Um, prostate cancer, some breast cancers, uh, cervical cancer um, can be driven by the more aggressive estrogens. Hmm. And that can be experienced in not just women, but men, because do women have prostates? No, men have prostates and it's an estrogen driven cancer. So it affects us all. And that has nothing to do with your skin and it can still affect your health. So this is like topics of information for everyone all right so the um where oh yeah yeah this is important too so the other side of the coin too little overall estrogen and very low good estrogen the e3 um, then there's nothing to keep the androgens the male hormones in check and then acne can really go hog wild 
So as you can see, there are multiple facets of acne and the hormones at play in multiple combinations, and it can get really, really hairy. So estrogen, one more tip on it, it's made in the fat cells of your body. So this is one more thing to consider, and it's not gonna apply to everyone, just a few people out there. If you have very, very, very low body fat and um, are over athletic, and you do not get your period, um, that can also come alongside, or hormonal acne can also come alongside that. So if that's you, then you have a, you know, a different scenario that you're working with. Um, but that's actually, you know, not, not a whole lot of people, not most of us. Okay. Whew. Let me take a breath. I really need something to drink. <laughs> so next time, part three, we will complete the endocrine system by discussing the rest of the hormones, progesterone, cortisol, and our adrenal glands, as well as the thyroid hormones. Okay. So we need to just talk about those to fully understand the endocrine system. And that will wrap that all up for us. Then finally in part four, because this keeps on going, we will address symptoms of hormonal imbalances and common imbalances seen in those with acne. This is going to be a very interesting video because it's going to be fun and it's going to be a video where you will be able to say, oh yeah, like I relate to that symptom and that symptom and that symptom and that symptom and you'll see the category um, and the hormones that it falls under. So it'll be a little bit more fun and um, applicable in a really colloquial way to your life. Because I know this stuff was like super abstract, but kind of had to touch on it all. And it's really interesting. So if nothing else, you learn something, hopefully. At least I'm constantly learning and relearning. I mean, I learned all of this stuff, oh gosh, it was seven years ago when I was really digging deep into hormones, read a lot of books, um, and then I readdressed it two and a half years ago when I went off of birth control. I have some great books that I'm gonna share with you guys during that part four. And I'm also, I have some really awesome supplements um, not a lot, just a couple really, really good ones that I'm gonna share with you guys in part four as well. The last thing I'm gonna share with you guys in part four is testing um, and some action steps that you can take. And yes, supplements and lifestyle and diet will all fall under action steps. Um, testing is important. It's not necessary, but it can help you understand things quicker um, and with a better picture. Okay, I told you all this was a big nut to crack. I know. It was a big nut for me to crack and then spit back out. And you saw me struggle with a bunch of words and that's fine too. Um, don't even worry about those words. I don't think you're gonna be regurgitating them to anybody either. <laughs> if you've hung in there for me with me for this full video, then you've really gotten a lot of information today and you can always go back and re-listen and take notes and um, I will link that study at the bottom so if you want to dive deeper into some things um, in terms of what is important for you, right? Because not everything's going to be applicable to you. All right. Um, really, that's all as far as the endocrine system is concerned for today. and. I just want to I just want to leave you guys with like one little note because I oh gosh I know that this was so much information and confusing information and I'm no freaking expert but I do know a lot and I'm always refreshing my memory because when you don't use it you lose it right and this is something to just take away from this video um Hormones aside, <laughs> life is as beautiful or as horrific as you make it. And there's always, always a choice in terms of how you experience your situation. So if acne is something you're dealing with, even dealing with it, it can be a beautiful experience or it can be a horrific experience. And that is up to you. 
But that's why Acne Beautiful is here, because we are here for you, so you don't have to do it alone. The last thing I'm going to say is don't give up on yourself. If you feel overwhelmed and confused, that's okay. Just don't give up on yourself. Stick with it. Hang in there with me, Morgan, with Acne Beautiful. The real you is the best you. And the real you is in there underneath any acne that's on the surface. And the acne is just a little thing. It's just a little thing to work through with a big lesson. You have to really want it though. Like anything in life that's worth achieving, you have to really, really freaking want it. And when you really, really want it, you're willing to listen, you're willing to talk about the hard things, you're willing to take hard looks at yourself, and you're willing to put down your guard and say, where can I do better? And I love you. <laughs> and I love you, I love all of you. And I love me too. So thank you for joining me today. I'll see you all next time for part three and have a really beautiful rest of your day. Bye.